So thanks for turning up um, to this faculty tech talk. Um, so we're going to be talking today about um, representation learning and specifically representation learning on audio data. And this is motivated by a particular use case we're interested in, which is um, speaker classification. So essentially training machine learning models to be able to identify if two pieces of audio contain the same person speaking, uh, even if we don't know who that, that person is uh, or, or haven't heard any clips from them before. Um, so just by way of some remote introduction, so I'm Scott, uh, I'm a data scientist at faculty. Uh, I've been working with the team here, so Lawrence and Kim. Um, so we're going to share the, the talk between us. We're all going to speak a little bit. Um, so our team is broadly interested in a, in a combination of things that have uh, resulted in this work. So um, generative modeling and, and variational autoencoders. Uh, and also for a couple of years, we've been on and off working on, on machine learning on what you might call rich media, so uh, video and, and audio, which leads us to today. Um, so I'm going to speak for the first part, and then uh, Lawrence is going to take over for a middle segment and, and Kim at the end. So um, you'll kind of hear from them, and I guess they can introduce themselves a little bit more um, during their section. Um, so the outline today is, uh, I'll kick off with a bit of an introduction. So you know, what are representations? What are they in the context of machine learning? And why might we want to learn them rather than specify them? And they're going to a little bit of detail about how this relates to working with audio data. So why audio data is, is sometimes difficult to work with and what some approaches um, for machine learning with audio are and, and what the new approaches we've been exploring are. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Lawrence, who's going to go into some of the details about our approaches to generative models for, um, for learning representations for audio. And then Kim will um, share some of the experiments we've been uh, carrying out and some of the models we've built, and we can um, look, at, look at some results and, and, uh, and where that leaves us. Um, we're also gonna leave 15 minutes at the end for some Q&A. Um, because we're all remote and we have three different speakers, uh, we're going to do answer all the questions at the end, but in Zoom, you should be able to see a Q&A bot button at the bottom. So if you've got a question at any point in the talk, um, please type it in there uh, and we'll, we'll go to those and answer them at the end of the talk. I just ask like, because um, it might have been a while since then, since you were asking the question, just to like make sure there's enough context in the question that we can you know, know which slide and, and piece it relates to. Cool, so I'll um, crack on them with, with the first introduction. So this is gonna be, broadly you know what is representation learning uh, why do we don't want to do it before we dive into the details and i actually want to start not with machine learning at all but with something um really simple something so simple you might not actually have, have thought about it very much before um so i want to demonstrate why representations are important by actually just talking about numbers so you can imagine um there are actually like although numbers are such a fundamental concept there's actually many different ways of representing them um so for example you know, I can, I can tally numbers uh, just by making simple lines on a page. I can use Arabic numerals, Roman numerals. So these are all different representations of the same kind of data of numbers. And the important point here is that these different representations, even though they, they represent the same number, so the tally for five represents the same thing as the Arabic numeral for five, they're very well suited to different tasks. So like tallies are very well suited to counting, um, but binary is uh, much better suited for like implementing in, in computers and electronic circuits. So the point is that actually which representation of data you use um, strongly influences like uh, how easy uh, it is to do specific downstream tasks. Um, and in a completely analogous way, uh, specific representations of data will make specific machine learning tasks easier or harder. So we're interested in representations because if we have a good representation of our data, it'll allow us to build more powerful and more accurate models. So we could design representations. So here the representations for numbers are all kind of invented or designed by humans. Um, but a, a more powerful approach is representation learning. So that's the approach we're taking today. So representation learning is about not having humans design the representations of data, but in fact, like discovering them, learning them from data itself using machine learning. So um, the kind of conventional way of specifying representations is, is the kind of field of feature engineering. Um, so this is where humans specify transformations of data. So for example, if I'm doing a, an NLP task, a natural language processing, working with text data, 
there's a lot of common feature transformations that, that humans have designed and done. So it might be simple things like counting how many times a word appears in a text or uh, how many words are in the average sentence, for example. Um, that kind of works in some domains. Uh, in, in other domains, especially like very complex real world data, especially things like video and audio, um, it's much more difficult to specify them. So that's why uh, learning them with machine learning is much more powerful. And in addition to it being very powerful for this like complex real world data, it also means that if we link learning a representation to learning the task we want to do, we can get a, an algorithm to learn a very abstract representation that's very well suited to the task. That's not something humans uh, would have thought of or, or necessarily is that intuitive to human, humans, but provides you very good downstream performance, like high accuracy in a classifier. So we're gonna take the approach of trying to learn our representations for audio rather than just designing them and specifying them as the programmers. And we're doing this in, in audio data. Um, so like I said, audio data is, uh, it, it's, it's not so simple to kind of define human features. It's much harder than say, if you had free text and you could define features like how many times different words appear or how many words are there in, in a sentence. And we're, um, we're interested in specific kind of audio modeling, particularly for this work that we did, which was speaker classification. Um, and the reason for this, it's like it broadly uh, of a lot of interest right now. Um, I'd summarize this as being because um, you know, it's kind of often easier to interact with systems by speaking to them than it is by other interfaces. It's like as a, as a silly little example, if you're cooking in the kitchen and your hands are covered in ingredients, but you need to set a timer for the oven, it's really convenient to be able to ask you know, a smartwatch or a phone to set a timer for you rather than like try and get your phone out of your pocket when you've got like egg all over your hands. Um, but we often only want to accept instructions from a specific set of people, right? So if I did have a smart speaker, I could set timers on. It's also really convenient to be able to ask that smart speaker to add some stuff to my shopping list to replace the ingredients I'm using. Um, being if I've got a child uh, at home, I don't necessarily want them like copying me and then realizing they can order stuff just by talking to the smart speaker and like ordering a thousand pounds of Lego or like sweets or something. Um, so we want to be able to interact with systems through voice interfaces, but it's also really important to, to be able to limit who's interacting with them to be, to be able to recognize a speaker. Um, and kind of in a less playful, maybe more, more serious example, for those of you in work in business, you can imagine you know, in a customer service environment, um, a customer service representative, a, a call center um, needs to you know, authenticate that the customer who's ringing up saying, ask him to authorize a transfer is who they say they are. But on the customer's part, you don't want it to be too laborious and them having to like dig out a lot of account numbers, past transactions, etc. Um, so this is why we're, we're interested in this problem. So audio modeling is um, quite difficult um, just in general because of the kind of um, the specifics of audio data. Um, so the you know, speech as, as you hear it now, me speaking might seem quite low dimensional. You could imagine, well, it's really only the words I'm saying and then maybe there's like a a categorical variable that says, do I sound happy or do I sound sad or angry? Um, but, but that kind of dimensional, low dimensional representation is, is insufficient to, to really be able to like reproduce or identify if it's me speaking versus someone else saying the same words. You know, there's all the idiosyncrasies due to like the physiology of my larynx, et cetera. Um, and aside from the data as well, because you need like a high bit rate to like get good fidelity audio. So as you can see in the, in the animation here, yeah, a second of audio contains tens of thousands of data points. Uh, audio, modical, audio modeling is also difficult just because um, it's very compute intensive because you need very high sample rates. So there's a couple of traditional approaches that we're gonna to briefly touch on um, for uh, defining features or representations for audio data. Um, if you've had any exposure to the field before, I mentioned these because they kind of might, might ring a bell, but we're looking at um, kind of trying to go beyond this. Um, it's a very traditional way of learning features or representations for audio data. It's something called an I vector. Um, and an I vector is basically just a, a set of human transformations um, that goes from your, your data, does these transformations uh, that humans have specified, and gives you a fixed length vector. And then that fixed length vector is useful because you can just use that as a low dimensional representation of your data. And you can pass that to a simple classifier. So you could pass the I vector to like a logistic regression or a support vector machine to classify different speakers. 
So this is human specified and that, that representation isn't improved or learned for any particular task. And this is the, the traditional way of doing it. Um, a more modern way is, is an approach that is known within like the audio sphere as X vectors, uh, which replace live vectors and gives, gives you better performance. And in this, it's quite similar in that our intention is to like build a fixed length vector that we can pass to another classifier like a just regression. Um, but you use supervised learning to achieve that. So you, you know, for example, train a neural network to classify non-speakers. So for example, this would only, you can, you can only train this network to identify speakers who are in the training set. So it wouldn't generalize to like you know, a bank that doesn't want to retrain its model every time a new customer signs up. But you use this neural network with a small set of known level speakers um, to do a classification task. And then you use one of the hidden layers in that neural network, you extract that and use that as your fixed vector to pass to another classifier. So because you have a supervised learning process here, it's not you know, entirely human specified, you can learn a good representation. But there's this disconnect between the final task and the eventual classifier and the neural network that um, learned to provide that feature vector. So you can't pass information back from the final task and fine tune it. So you don't get full, the full power of representation learning here. And you're you know, theoretically leaving some performance on the table by not doing uh, you know, complete representation learning. So, yeah, that's all been a setup really to um, the question that we hope to answer in the work we've been doing recently and, and kind of summarizing this talk, which is, um, can we learn a representation for speaker classification completely? So we don't use human engineered features. We just use deep learning to learn a representation that um, gives us the maximum performance of a speaker classification model. Um, and that's what we're going to, to dive into in the rest of this talk. That said, we are going to allow ourselves one little affordance. We're not going to do it completely end to end. Um, so that affordance is um, we're going to allow ourselves one transformation of the data initially. Um, and that transformation is, is going to be to convert the raw audio waveform, so that's the, the picture at the top left here, into something called a spectrogram, which is the, the picture on the bottom left. So a spectrogram, if you've got background in like physics or engineering, you might recognize is like a Fourier transform. Um, and what, what that means, if you don't, is it just converts um, a, a wave from its representation over time into a representation of what frequencies are present in that wave. Um, so it's a very well established um, kind of part of all signal processing on very solid mathematical foundations. Uh, so it's very well motivated. Um, and one big advantage it gives from a machine learning perspective is that um, the output is now this two dimensional array that you see on the bottom left, uh, which you know, looks a lot like a picture, like an image. And the power in this is now we have this two dimensional image, basically, we can apply a lot of techniques from computer vision, which uh, in comparison to audio modeling is a much more mature area of machine learning. Um, so we can take a lot of you know, existing research and results and knowledge about how to how to do modeling of images. So for example, everything we know about how convolutional neural networks learn and apply them to audio, which is, which is very useful. Um, so we're gonna allow ourselves to convert the audio to a spectrogram before we then do our representation learning on it. Um, one thing to point out though in, in, in full transparency that the conversion to a spectrum is a lossy process. So there's some information present in that original wave that is not preserved um, in, the, in the spectrogram. Um, so that's FAIRS if you're interested. Okay, so we're going to convert an audio wave to a spectrogram and then uh, use representation learning to, to learn a really powerful model for speaker classification. So there's two broad um, approaches to classification, um, you know, kind of categories of models, which are generative models and discriminative models. So a discriminative model are kind of simpler models. So, so things you might be familiar with like logistic regression or support vector machines. And um, what they're doing is they're essentially, if I have two dimensional data on a plane with a lot of points, a discriminative model is trying to learn a line that separates the points in one class from the points in another class. So it's learning this conditional probability that um, a you know, particular data belongs to a particular class. Um, generative models on the other hand, rather than just trying to learn you know, a line that separates different classes, is trying to learn the joint distributions. It's trying to actually learn the, the distribution of data, um, not just a decision boundary through that data. Um, so one really powerful thing about this is because we learn in the underlying distribution, we can actually then sample from that, which means in a generative model, we cannot just classify examples, but we can generate new examples. 
Um, so you might have seen uh, things like uh, machine learning models that generate new pictures of faces of people that don't really exist. Um, and that's an example of a generative model. Um, so you know, an example of this class of models is, for example, variational autoencoders, which is, which is the uh, architecture we're going to talk about and use. And um, the crucial reason we're going to be using generative models, uh, and which Lawrence and Kim will dive into in a lot more detail, is that um, because we have this model of the underlying data distribution, not just a decision boundary between known classes, we can actually classify between speakers that weren't in the training set because we can map them into this data distribution and, and see if they like less to one another. And so if they like less to one another, then um, yeah, they're very likely to be the same person. If they're very far away, they're not the same person, which is independent of kind of um, a decision boundary uh, learned from this distribution. So that's a bit of a whirlwind tour of like what representational learning is and why we want to do it on audio for speaker classification. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Lawrence now, who's going to talk about kind of the actual models and, and architectures we use. Thank you, Scott. Uh, let me just take hold of the screen here. Um, okay, fantastic. So, um, Brilliant. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk about um, about generative models for for um, uh, sorry generative models for represent learning representations of the data. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three different uh, different types of model. Firstly, we're going to talk about uh, autoencoders, which are the sort of most straightforward, basic uh, version of these generative models. I'm going to briefly touch on variational autoencoders, which are a slight modification of that architecture. And then finally, uh, talk about Equibake, which is the, the architecture that we have uh, implemented as our um, on this on this audio data. Now, um, throughout this this section of the talk, rather than talking about audio data, uh, I'm actually going to, to use examples using the the MNIST data set. For those of you that are not familiar necessarily with the with the MNIST data set, um, it is it is uh, sixty thousand handwritten digits. And, and each um, image is, is 28 pixels by 28 pixels, meaning that that's 784 pixels per image. And this data set um, is commonly used when, when testing machine learning models, uh, really due to its sort of simplicity uh, and, and sort of you can, you can really easily see when your, when your model is, is learning it well, uh, when it's not performing so well as well. So, um, First of all, let's let's discuss autoencoders. So, so what is an autoencoder? Well, very simply, an autoencoder is a is an unsupervised learning model that learns to generate uh, the data that it is passed. So, so you uh, pass in a, a, an image, say on the left, uh, like this image of a one. You pass it through your machine learning model, and it will hopefully regenerate the same image uh, of itself. And it and it it trains by, by uh, minimizing the difference between the, the image that it generates and the image that it was, that was given in the first place. Now, uh, this, this problem might sound uh, entirely trivial if we were allowed to ch arbitrarily choose the, the sort of uh, style of the, of the model that we're using here. We could just learn to map each pixel back to itself. Um, but for an autoencoder, we actually enforce uh, a bottleneck on this, on this network. So if we use a neural network, we, we force um, the information through a very small number of nodes uh, in the middle layer, and and this really forces the data to be to be compressed, forces the information in that in that original image to be compressed, and then forces the model to learn how to decompress that image as well, uh, back up to the original size. Now, in order to be able to compress that image down to just a just a few a few numbers, we go from 784 pixels, remember, down to just to, just a few different. Uh, a few a few dimensions. We really need to rely on on there being correlations within within the original data. So if each of these pixels were completely independent and there was no correlation between them, we wouldn't be able to compress that information. We would need to be able to preserve uh, the information within each pixel to be able to recreate the data. But because there are correlations uh, in this picture, you know, for example, all the pixels around the edge are, are likely to be turned off. You know, we can we can compress that information. Uh, and we can reduce the, the amount of information that we need to pass through our bottleneck uh, while still being able to recreate good, rep um, good re uh, reconstruction of the data on the other side. And the size of this, this bottleneck determines the level of compression that we, we achieve with our autoencoder. 
if we choose a, a very, very small bottleneck, then we really um, force the model to, to choose which information is the most important in order to be able to, to generate the best reconstruction of the, of the data. If we, if we choose a slightly uh, a bottleneck that's, that's much larger, um, we basically allow the, the model to have much higher capacity and allow the, the uh, model to basically memorize uh, the original training data. And so, so choosing the size of this bottleneck is, is really important for training a good autoencoder. So autoencoders are really two separate models. The, the first part is the encoder and that takes our original data point and compresses it down to some low dimensional representation of the data. And then the second model is a decoder that takes that low dimensional representation and, and decompresses it back up to the size of the original data. And so after training our autoencoder, we've now, we've now got these two separate models that we can use independently. So the encoder is now optimized to, to encode the original data into this low, low dimensional representation. And for, for all the examples in this, in this talk I'm going to uh, discuss for MNIST, we're, we're using a dimension of two. So that means that for, for each image, I'm going to encode it as a, a two dimensional vector. Now, <clears throat> the space in which this vector lies is often referred to as as the latent space, uh, and you know we don't need to worry too much about the terminology. But just to to know that the latent space, we can think of it as basically an x y plot, and our representation is a point in that x y space. And we'll see that example uh, on the next slide. Now it's important to remember that the this representation that we've learned, this two dimensional vector must contain nearly as much information as the original image in the first place, because if we can successfully decode this representation back to, back to being approximately the original image, it, all that information must be stored in that two-dimensional vector. And so what we've really managed to achieve here is, is feature engineering, as, as Scott was mentioning in the first part. Um, we have trained a model to extract the important information from this, uh, from this image uh, and compress it down to a really low number of dimensions. So let's have a look at some examples with the, with the MS data. So here is that, that latent space I was talking about. So this is two dimensional uh, space that we are mapping our, our images into. And each of the colored dots here represents a different um, image that we have encoded into this latent space. So uh, here we can see the red dots at the bottom are uh, zeros, the green dots in the top right are ones, the sort of teal dots on the, on the left hand side are, are sixes. Uh, and the other digits there as well. And we can see that these points are not just randomly scattered. Obviously, the, the points that are similar to each other, so the original images that are similar to each other, are plotted near to each other. And that means that they have similar representations. And this is good because it means that our representations have, have meaning. They're not just completely uh, random. But we can see that, you know, clearly more is being represented than just the just the class, you know, if we were just representing zeros, then all of the all of the images of zeros would be plotted on top of each other because they'd all have the same representation. Uh, and so clearly we're, we're encoding more information than just the class. So let's dig into this a bit more. And we can do that by sampling from the latent space at regular intervals, and then passing that uh, sampled representation to the decoder, and that will, um, Give us, give us back uh, a decoded digit. And so if we uh, take a point in the top right of this, of the left-hand plot, so at the 2020, uh, and we pass that to the decoder, we can see that we actually decode that into a one. And if we take a point in the top left of this plot, at minus 2020, then we can see that we decode that into a nine. And so we can, we can sort of see actually that the reason why these points are scattered for the same class is that we're encoding information about the handwriting style here as well, so not just the class. So for the ones in the top right hand side, we can see that there's lots of different sort of forms that one can take from slanting up and to the left uh, to being vertical to being slanting up and to the right. And so, and so we're actually having to encode quite a lot of information uh, in this, this two-dimensional uh, representation. Now something um, if we were using this autoencoder as a generative model, as Scott was uh, mentioning earlier, and so if we were talking about um, using this to generate new data, uh, you can see that we might run into a problem here. And that is that there are large 
parts of this latent space that are actually not used uh, by the by the the encoder. So the the bottom right quadrant of this um, of this uh, latent space is sort of not actually populated with uh, images. And there's actually also no constraint on on where these uh, um, representations are are mapped to in in this latent space. So so they could be absolutely anywhere within within these two dimensions. There's, there's no constraint uh, holding them to a particular location. And so if we were to, to randomly sample from this latent space, uh, there's no guarantee that we would actually generate sort of sensible uh, looking, looking data points. And so variational autoencoders actually solve this problem. And they solve this problem by um, enforcing a penalty in the loss function that penalizes any points that are plotted significantly far away from the, the point zero zero in our, um, in our latent space. Now, obviously, the, the sort of inner workings of that loss function are slightly more complicated than, than simply penalizing um, that, but, uh, but that's the basic effect. And what that means is that the, the points are actually clustered much more successfully around the point zero zero. And we also end up with much smoother transitions between the different uh, classes here, as we can see on the right hand side. However, what we really want to learn, as, as Scott was motivating us earlier, is we want to learn representations that are suited to classification models. And you know, in, in both of these, both of these models, both autoencoders and variational autoencoders, we could we could try and take these representations and pass them to a classification model and draw decision boundaries between these between these points. Uh, and you know, we would we would probably have quite good success with with some of the classes, say zeros and, and ones and sixes, perhaps we could. Uh, draw quite neat decision boundaries through here to to classify those those digits, uh, but the other the other numbers are, are not so straightforward to to separate off. Now, clearly in this example, I've I've chosen a two dimensional latent space, and you know that provides a very high level of compression, and we could choose a, a, a higher dimensional latent space, and that might separate out these these digits a bit more successfully. But there's actually no guarantee that uh, the representations we learn are going to be like nicely separable by, by simple and easy to learn decision boundaries. And so, so that's where, the, where Equivay really comes in. You know, we, want, we want to learn representations that are suited to classification models specifically. And so we really need to be able to disentangle information about the class from information uh, that, that varies within the class. So in this example, you know, we want to be able to separate the, the class, which is the digit, from the handwriting style. You know. Or if we're talking about a speaker classification, we want to be able to separate the, the tone and, and pitch of someone's voice from the words that they're saying. And so Equibay does this by um, explicitly encoding the data as two separate uh, representations. Firstly, we encode an autoencoder that uh, encodes the class information. And secondly, a VAE that encodes the variation within the class. So uh, I think I'm probably going a little bit slowly, so I'll try and speed up. So this is how Equibay uh, works. We, we pass in lots of examples of the same class. Uh, we pass them through the same neural network, and we average the output of that uh, of that neural network. And by averaging the output, we we forget or we we don't learn the information that uh, varies between the different images. We only keep the information that's consistent within the images, and that hopefully is the class information. So that is what our invariant encoder learns: is is it learns just the information that's common to the class. Our second encoder um, then tries to learn features that are that vary within the class and it does this by um, passing the the image through a neural network but also being passed the representation that holds the class information and so it's actually not worth the model trying to learn anything about the class because it's it's easier for it to get it from this representation one and so we we so we then learn an encoder that, that learns the features that vary within the class as well and then we can take the output of both of these, uh, these two encoders, the invariant and equivariant encoders, as they're called, and we can pass that to the decoder. And, and together, that allows them to regenerate the original data. And so here we have um, the, both, both representations for, for the MNIST data. And so we can see on the left-hand side, this is our, um, our representation that's learning the class. And we can see that all the data points are plotted on top of each other. And that's like,
I think Lawrence might have lost internet connection, uh, which you warned me might happen because it's been happening a bit recently. Uh, so we'll see if he can reconnect shortly. Apologies for that um, slight. Oh no. Can you, you guys still see me? Scott or Kim? Yeah, okay, fantastic. Cool, sorry about that, uh, minor technical hiccup. Um, so, if we, if we... We don't have uh, your slides, uh, Lawrence. You can't see my slides, fantastic. Okay, let me share that. Cool, can you see my slides again now? Yep, back now, thanks. Cool, uh, apologies for that. Um, so we sample, yes, as I said, we're going to sample from the, from representation two uh, evenly and, and just look at a particular few clusters on the, from the, the classes. So, so uh, here we can see, we, again, we're sort of decoding uh, the, the latent space and we can see that for the, if we, for a representation one, we take zero, sevens and nines and then we decode um, by randomly sam or sampling the, uh, from representation two, we can see that we're actually encoding the, the handwriting style here really nicely. And so in this latent space, um, the handwriting style sort of slants from left to right and uh, as we go across the image and then sort of the images get uh, from thin to thick as we go up the image. So we've, we've shown how we can use equivalent classification or uh, to encode representations, uh, but how do we use it for, for classification? Well, all we need to do is, is simply pass our digit through the invariant encoder and produce these, these um, very tightly clustered representations. And then we can then pass those to a, to a classifier. And so now I'll hand over to Kim, who will talk about uh, how we can use this for audio data. Awesome, thanks, Lawrence. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, yep, here we go. Awesome. So hopefully you can see my screen now. So uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about an application of the Equivay model, this time to an audio data set. And basically what we want to know is uh, whether the invariant representation that Lawrence has just described is well suited to classification tasks with audio. So let me first tell you about the data set um, that we, we use. So this is the LibriSpeech data set. Um, so this is openly available online and it's basically people who have uploaded recordings of themselves reading books aloud. So it has a, a large number of speakers and also a large amount of speech. So there's about 40 days worth of audio data in this data set. And if you bear in mind that in um, audio data, there's 16,000 samples for every second of audio data, that's a huge amount of data for us to play with. So. The first thing we're going to do is remove 10% of the speakers in the data set. Um, so basically 10% of speakers are not going to be seen by the model at all at any point. Um, and that's basically how we're going to evaluate how well um, the representation is going to work when we um, apply it to speakers who haven't been seen by the model. Um, cool. So. Um, what we're going to do first is we're going to um, pre-process the data. So we, we take our clips from LibriSpeech of people speaking and we chop them into three second chunks. And then, as Scott said earlier, we're going to convert these three second clips into segments. Um, into spectrograms, which we're then going to use to train the model. 
So how do we do this? So this is similar to what Lawrence was showing before. For each clip we use uh, to, to train the, the model, what we do is we take a number of clips from the same speaker and we also pass these through the, the invariant encoder, this, this first encoder. So the hope is that um, the invariant encoder will learn information common to all of these clips and therefore will give us information about the speaker. And then, as Lawrence said before, we have this equivariant encoder, which should learn kind of everything else, basically. So that should be the content of, of the speech rather than uh, information about the speaker. So we then pass these representations through the decoder and we get out a new spectrogram, which should be, um, and we train our model so that this is as similar as possible to the original spectrogram, basically. So once we've trained our model, um, we can do some analysis on the, the model we, we've got. So remember that um, we're going to be interested in the invariant representation R for our downstream classification task. But the closer the reconstructed spectrogram that we get out of the decoder to the original spectrogram, the better information encoded in our representation. So just a note here, so our spectrograms that we're using to train the model are 128 by 298 matrices, which basically means they're 38,000 dimensional data points. These um, representations, R and V, that we learn here are both 128 dimensional data points. So when we pass these two vectors through the decoder, we're producing something that's got kind of 38,000 dimensions from something that's got 256 dimensions. So that's a pretty insane compression that we're doing here. And as I said, um, whilst this isn't kind of the main point, what we're doing, the better the reconstruction, the kind of better we can expect our, our model can perform on downstream tasks. This means we've got a good representation. So we can eyeball these spectrograms um, and see that so the, the reconstruction, it definitely looks a little bit noisy, but it's kind of dark in a, a similar place to the, um, the original spectrogram. But I guess the best way of evaluating how good our reconstruction is not to just eyeball spectrograms, but it would be to, to listen to the audio clips. So as Scott said in the beginning, um, we have kind of lost some information when we're converting the audio clip to a spectrogram, but we can reconstruct audio from a spectrogram using this algorithm called Griffin Lim. But it, it's not going to be a perfect reconstruction, but it's kind of good enough. So uh, let's listen to this original clip. And she leaned back in her chair, limp and un. And then let's listen to the reconstructed clip that we've passed through the echo bay. <laughs> so it definitely sounds a lot like a robot speaking, but What's really cool, I think, is that you can actually make out the words. So you can hear that it's the one saying the same words as the original clip. <laughs> so <clears throat> again, this isn't really kind of the point of what we do, but it's kind of a good way to demonstrate what the different representations uh, learn. So we can use the Equive not only to reconstruct um, uh, audio clips like I've just shown you, but we can create completely new audio clips. So what we can do is we take our audio and clip. And she leaned back in her chair, limp and unknown. From before, which we reconstructed. <laughs> and then we can take the invariant representation, the speaker representation R, and combine it with a completely different sample from the equivariant latent space. So this should correspond to some different content of what the speaker is saying. So let's have a listen. So you can kind of hear it's got quite a similar intonation to our, our reconstructed spectrogram. But it's no longer saying kind of recognizable word. And we're not expecting for it to say something completely different. We're, we're not trying to get the model to, to learn the speech itself, but this kind of 
similar to Lawrence's example of MNIST with the hand, handwriting style, this shows you that the, the equivariant um, representation is learning kind of the content of the clip rather than properties of the speaker. So we can do similar things um, by taking two different clips. So this is a, a clip of a different speaker speaking. Sometimes it may not be a kind of unpledged and which we can pass through our equivate and reconstruct. <laughs> so again, it's a little bit distorted, but what we can do is we can take the, the equivariant latent from the first clip. So that's the content of the first clip and the speaker representation, the invariant representation from the second clip. And what we would hope to get if our model's working perfectly is the, the second speaker saying the words of the first speaker. So let's have a listen. So that's definitely saying the same words as the first speaker. And it, it's very subtly different. The difference certainly isn't striking, but I think you can hear that they are slightly different. And we can do the same with the, the other way around. So we take the content from the, the second speaker and make the first speaker say it. So let's in. So again, this is a bit harder to make out, but if we compare it to the, the the first spectrogram. So I think you can hear that this is slightly lower in pitch, which you kind of expect from a, a male speaker. So this kind of demonstrates um, what the different representations do. But um, what we actually want to do is understand how well this invariant representation R, the speaker representation, is encoding information about a certain speaker. So to demonstrate this, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a number of clips from 10 different speakers and we're going to pass them through the invariant encoder of the equivalent in order to get a representation for each clip, which remember is a 128 dimensional vector. So we can then plot these points colour each point by speaker, and then use a dimension reduction tool. Uh, we use TSNI here um, and visualise the results in two dimensions. So let me show you the, the results here. So this is on clips taken from the, the training sets for the Equive. So these are, are clips that the Equive model saw during training. And as you can see, it's uh, the the clips are pretty well clustered together by speakers. So remember the colour represents a clip from a certain speaker, as I've kind of illustrated with these little diagrams here. And we actually have some really good like separation between the different speakers as well. There's a few points that have fallen a little bit far off, but in general, I would call that a pretty good performance. Uh, we can do the same with um, test clips. So these are clips um, from the speakers that the Equive has heard before, but not clips that the, we use to train the model. So again, we have pretty good clustering um, and good separation. But what we really care about is how well um, the Equive creates representations for speakers it hasn't heard before. So you remember I put aside 10% of the speakers when we first started. Um, so we, we're going to bring these back now. Uh, chop up the clips like we did with the, the rest of the data and put them through the Equive and um, find the representations and plot them. And we can see we've got slightly less good clustering here, but still some pretty clear clusters. So I um, actually think this is a, a pretty good um, performance, given that this model has never heard speech by any of these speakers before. So let's talk a little bit about an actual application. So um, we've mentioned speaker classification. So basically what happens here is we train a model which is given clips of different speakers speaking and it's told which speaker is saying which clip. And the model is going to tell us, given an audio clip, which speaker it thinks has said the words in the clip. So this is going to be like massively difficult with these 
um, 48,000 dimensional audio clips. So what we do instead is we convert to a spectrogram, pass through the invariant encoder and get our speaker representation R, which we were plotting before, train a classifier to predict which clip was spoken by which speaker. So we did this just using a simple logistic regression model, and that gave us an accuracy of 98.2% on a held L test set. But this is kind of a bit of an unrealistic problem. Um, so for example, in the, the bank example, Scott was talking about at the beginning, um, you, you don't want to have a classification algorithm. You don't want to get a load of audio data from every new customer you get and retrain your model to recognize this person as a potential speaker. What you want to do is you want to take two clips and you want to say whether they are or are not from the same speaker. So we're going to call this speaker verification. So again, we're going to turn our audio clips into uh, representations. These are here. And remember, these are, are just 128 dimensional vectors. And what we can do is we can measure the angle between two speaker representations, theta, here. So this is basically just by doing the dot product, you get the, the cosine of the angle between two vectors. Um, and then to uh, create a speaker verification model, we take two representations, compute this cosine similarity, so that the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, and then we use this to train a classifier to say whether these two clips are from the same speaker or not. So this is just um, a binary classifier. Um, and uh, we, we trained a binary classifier on this. And we can basically produce a rock curve of, of the result. So I'm sure you're probably familiar with rock curves already. But basically, um, a perfect classifier would have the area under this curve equal to 1. So the, the closer this is to kind of a, a rectangle, uh, the better. Um, and we see that we get pretty good performance, even on speakers that have never been heard by the model before. And bear in mind that um, when we're doing this pairwise classification problem, depending on how many speakers uh, we have, um, it's very rare that you'd actually get two clips being the same. Um, more, it's vastly more likely that two clips will not be from the, the same speaker. So it's a pretty fine balance to, to get this right. And the, the threshold you would choose for acceptance kind of depends heavily on your, your use case. Um, so to summarize um, what we've learned in this talk, so uh, we've learned that a good representation of data can improve model performance on some desired downstream task. And if we're clever, we can use machine learning to, to learn such a representation. We saw that audio data is highly complex and that in recent years, machine learning techniques have surpassed manual feature extraction techniques used in the, in the past. We saw that generative models can be used to generate representations of data, but that these representations are not necessarily well suited to downstream tasks such as classification. And finally, we saw that the Equivay is a generative model that learns a representation that is well suited specifically to classification tasks. We saw that we got good performance on an audio data set, and even better, we got good performance on classifying whether two clips are from the same speaker, even if the model has never heard that speaker before. So I think that's all we wanted to talk about. So we, we've got some time now for, for Q&A. So I, I think Scott is going to lead that. Yeah, so I've been... Um collecting uh, some of the questions as they come through. Um, there are a couple just around um, slides and recording, uh, which I, I'll answer all together. So yes, um, we'll uh, send out via the um, email you signed up for the Zoom webinar, a uh, link to the recording uh, when that's online and, and the slides, so you'll have that for reference. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna um, answer a couple, which I think were from my section of the talk, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, uh, to Lawrence for some of the others. Um, so there's one here from Manny, which was asking, uh, did we try to uh, extract words and identify when there was spoken language or what was being said or, or similar things like identifying music or noise? Um, so the answer is no, not in this work. 
Um, so we actually we chose the, the data sets we used uh, LibreSpeech as, as Kim mentioned um, specifically so we had data that we knew contained human speech so we could focus just on um, exploring and experimenting with the speaker classification task. Um, so if you had uh, data from a different source, it wasn't, for example, um, a smart speaker being activated or someone phoning up a bank and you didn't know there was human speech in it, you might need to add pre-processing to, to identify first when humans were speaking before you wanted to apply these kind of uh, techniques. Um, so there's another question, I think, uh, Lawrence, you're probably uh, best uh, placed to answer this. So this is asking, um, so when you were showing the plots of MNIST digits embedded into the latent representation, you showed this, this 2D latent space with X and Y axes. Um, so uh, what, what's the, inter is there an interpretation? What's the interpretation of the, the axes of the uh, latent space? Yeah, so, so in a, in a, a normal autoencoder or, or VAE or, or even in Equibay, um, the axes of, of the latent space are, are not meaningful. Um, so we, we choose how many dimensions um, that, we, that we map our data into, so, so how big the vector is that, that is the representation, um, but we, the actual values are, uh, are not meaningful. They are they're meaningful, relatively speaking, because we, as we saw, I, data points that are similar to each other will be mapped to similar points within the latent space. Um, um, and the, they're obviously meaningful to the decoder, but but to the to the human eye, um, or to a, to a human, they're, they're not um, meaningful. But um, the, the, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't models out there that can map to meaningful representation. So so there are models that are specifically designed to to disentangle um, representations, and so you can uh, have models that will say for. Um, for, for geometry models that are uh, recreating human faces, for example, you could say have um, one, one dimension that was particularly about hair color, another that was about eye color, another that's about smiling or frowning. Uh, and, so, and so you can actually train models to, to learn these particular, um, to, to learn that a particular dimension means a particular thing, but, but in these examples, we don't. Um, so just to, to manage expectations, um, we've only got five minutes left, but it's quite a few questions. So we're not going to be able to answer them all, but um, if, if your question doesn't get answered, like feel free to uh, send an email afterwards and we're happy to follow up. Um, so there's a question here from Louis uh, asking, so what's the relevance of phase? So I mentioned this at the start to the task of audio modeling. Um, so it's, it's difficult to tangibly say like what part of like, the speech I'm speaking now is is due to the phase encoded in the in the signal. Um, so I think the best way to do it is is to demonstrate it. Um, so I have here um, uh, a, a blog post. So this is uh, in the context of music rather than speech, but the same principles apply. Um, so there's a, a recording of, of some music here, um, which I think I'll actually need to configure Zoom to share my computer audio as well. So uh, a recording of some, some music here. So that sounds as you'd expect. Um, so then if you um, remove the phase from that, you can't, you can't play it, you can't get a waveform again. So what's been done here is the phase has been replaced just with a random uniform phase throughout. Uh, and, and this is what it sounds like when you replace the, the real phase information just with random uniform phase. So you can hear from that that um, like a, a lot of the structures there, it's not hugely lossy, um, but like the, the timber changes, it's, it's, you know, clearly there's some information lost, but the, the basic harmony is preserved. Uh, so it's quite hard to answer directly, but that's kind of gives you a, an intuitive feel for um, what the difference is. Um, so there's a question here, maybe Kim, you could answer this because uh, it's kind of about the classification task. This is asking, um, how robust or reliable do we think the model would be to, to noisy files, so if there was like echoes or background noise from different environments, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I think, um, so one thing worth saying about Libri speech is that the quality of the data is in general pretty high. It's people kind of speaking into a microphone, maybe in their bedroom or something like that. I think it's, um, 
you'd have a lot of challenges trying to work with like actual real life data. So uh, imagine you're on the phone to your bank and your kids are screaming in the background. Um, I think that would very likely confuse uh, the equine model. Um, I think if we were going to kind of seriously um, use the equine model in kind of an actual um, one of the use cases, what you'd want to do is combine it with some sort of audio pre-processing so you'd you'd want to kind of denoise it and there's, there's other problems like um, multiple speakers um, even things like um, does this clip contain speech at all um, is a, an inter interesting question um, to answer so I, yeah I think uh, this model on its own would not be particularly robust to poor quality audio data but I think you could combine it with other techniques to produce good enough data that this model would still perform well. Thanks, Kim. Um, so there's one here asking um, about the, the Equivay internals again, so maybe one for Lawrence. Um, so you were talking about how a variational autoencoder like tries to draw samples towards uh, the center of the distribution in the Latin space. Um, so the question is, uh, yeah, how, how do you measure that central tendency? Have you tried other uh, central tendency functions um, uh, like mean, median, nerd, uh, and what 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 effect do you expect that to have? So, so I read that question thinking it was um, talking about the sort of averaging procedure within the within the equivay, um, but but perhaps uh, we I can, I can try and answer both <laughs> to cover both both bases. So so um, in terms of um, in terms of the the variational autoencoder, um, the way that the way that, that that drawing data points towards the center is is done with um, uh, a function called the KL divergence, um, and and it works by having a prior distribution in your latent space that you normally define to be a, a normal with a mean zero and, and standard deviation of one, and then you your your encoder is actually a probabilistic uh, mapping, so it. it it outputs a, a mean and standard deviation uh, for each point. And then the KL divergence um, sort of compares that mean and standard deviation uh, and, and draws and like penalizes uh, the, the loss function of it if that, um, those two probability distributions are significantly different. Uh, and so I, I don't think something like a mean or a, or a median would, would necessarily make sense in that context. Um, with with the equibay uh, that that averaging process that we do in the in the invariant encoder, um, we're we're normally only passing a, a small number of of data points through that invariant encoder at once. So it's it's going to be it's sort of probably less than ten and and probably less than five really. Uh, and so we're talking about a very small number of of points to average over. Um, so. So something like a mean is, is quite natural for, for averaging over a small number of points. Uh, something like a, a median or a mode probably probably won't work so well. Um, but uh, but while the mean would be uh, very sensitive to outliers, maybe when the model is, is training initially, we, we would hope that the actual encoder network would learn to basically output the same um, representation for, for each digit, regardless, you know, if they're the same class, regardless of what the sort of handwriting style is uh, in the in the MNIST example, and so and so actually, um, I think I think that the, the mean is the most natural to use there. You you may have been answering the correct question. It might have been me who misread it. Um, so unfortunately, we're, we're a little bit over time now, so we'll have to um, wrap up. But as I said, if if you have a, a question you'd still like answering. Um, so we'll send out a recording of the webinar and a link to the slides afterwards. Um, you're more than welcome to, uh, to you know, email back and follow up and we're happy to answer stuff. Um, other than that, I just want to say thanks to everyone for, for turning up. I hope you uh, found that interesting and um, look out because I think we're intending to run uh, you know, more faculty tech talks about a range of the work we're doing in the future. So thanks everyone.